morning, everyone. Let's just pray just before I start. Father, I just want to thank you that you are here present with each one of us, wherever we are. And Father, I just pray that you would just open our hearts, soften our hearts to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would just loosen my tongue, as it were, to speak your words. In Jesus' name. Amen. Questions. Life is full of questions. When I was a child, if any of us said what, my, one of my siblings would say, where, when, why, how, who? All these questions. We get questions like, what's that for? What does that do? Why? What time is dinner? What's for dinner? Are we nearly there yet? I'm sure that these questions resonate with all of us. And um, questions are good for our growth and development. But what about questions in the Bible? The first one is a very sad question, as it questions the love, protection, authority, and goodness of God. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the Bible, in the garden, sorry? It twisted what God has said, because God's instruction was, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. How often we want what we don't have and forget all that we do have. So we generally do ask questions and people ask questions of us. So I was thinking, what about the questions that God asks? God's first question is found in Genesis 3, 8 to 10. Where are you? He had come in search of Adam and Eve. Adam and God would meet up in the cool of the evening and walk in the garden where they enjoyed friendship, companionship, fellowship. But that evening, things were different. Something was wrong. God was there, but no Adam and Eve. They had heard God in the garden and had hid from him. So God calls out, where are you? Did God not know where he was? Of course God knew, but he wanted Adam to acknowledge what he'd done. I was afraid and so I hid because I was naked. That action of taking the forbidden fruit had broken the relationship between God and Adam. Now Adam knew good and evil and what he'd done was not good. Shame made him try to hide from God. Psalm 139 verses 7 to 12 tells us that we can't hide from God's spirit no matter where we go. So we can't hide from God, but we can hide in God. Psalm 143 verse 9 says, I run to you to hide me. So where are you? Are you hiding from God or are you hiding in him? We use lots of excuses for hiding from God, busyness, tiredness, complacency, work, sin. These can and they do rob us from our time with God. I can easily allow myself to come up with these excuses, yet I hear God gently saying, Elizabeth, where are you? So, where are you? Last week, Rachel shared the story of the lost sheep and this farmer that climbed the mountains, scrambled over rocks, got scratched in order to find his lost sheep. And that's a picture of God. God searched Adam out. God still comes searching for you and me. Why? Because his desire is to have fellowship with us. Where are you? He leaves the 99 to look for the one who has wandered away. If you've lost your way, come back. Father God is asking, where are you? Has your first love for him turned cold? Come back. God is asking, where are you? Has your enthusiasm waned? Come back. Spend time with God and renew that fellowship, that relationship with him. Where are you? It's a searching question. Our next question, or it's two put together, is found in Genesis 16, verse 8. Where have you come from and where are you going? It's the story of Hagar and Sarai. It's a sad story. In the Bible, we do find the good 
the bad and the ugly. Briefly, Hagar is Sarah's Egyptian maidservant. Sarah and Abraham, Abraham had been promised an heir and many descendants, but it, they were getting on in years, and Sarah, Sarah is impatient at how long God is taking to fulfill this promise, and she decides to take matters into her own hands. In short, she encourages her husband Abraham to sleep with her maidservant Hagar, who then gets pregnant and treats Sarah and her mistress with contempt. According to the dictionary, contempt is the act of despising, being disrespectful. Other words connected with the word contempt are disdain, scorn, slighting. Words that do not make you feel good. Plans and ideas can work on paper, but in practice they don't, because on paper it doesn't take account for the human emotions. Often doing things our way and not God's results in pain and heartbreak. For Sarah, it meant adding insult to injury. And she blames Abram for her situation, though it was her idea. Sadly, she takes out her bitterness, frustration and pain on Hagar, treating her harshly, so much so that she runs away. And this is where God meets her. So we read in Genesis 16, verses 7 to 11. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness, along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. And in verse 13, thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? We read that the angel of the Lord found her. To be able to find someone or something, you have to be searching. So God was looking for her. Also notice, God calls her by name, Hagar, and knows who she is, Sarai's servant. Where have you come from and where are you going? Two very good questions. One talks about the past, the other one about the future. One generally is easier to answer than the other. Where have you come from? What's your story? We sang earlier on Blessed Assurance and the chorus is, this is my story, this is my song. Jesus is mine. The Israelites were constantly encouraged to remember where they'd come from. And as Christians, it's good to remember where we've come from, but not to live in the past, to see where we've come from and how far we've come. In Philippians 1.6, we read, He, that means God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Hagar admitted she was running away from her mistress. She knew where she was coming from, but had no idea where she was going. I suspect she was trying to get back to Egypt, to go back home. When things get difficult, we might be tempted to run away and escape. But sometimes it's only when we go through difficulties that we actually grow. She didn't know where she was going, but God did. And it's not what she wanted to hear. In the Amplified version, it reads, Go back to your mistress and submit humbly to her authority. What? I can just imagine her saying or even just thinking, you've got to be kidding me. To go back or stay in a difficult situation is hard. When I was a teacher, there came a time when I wanted to leave. But I had to get to the point of being willing to stay or leave. My preference was to leave. But God told me clearly to stay. It's not what I wanted to hear. 
So disappointed that I wasn't leaving, I was also elated in another way because God had heard me and God had spoken and he'd given me a promise. Hagar understood that God had seen her unhappiness and struggles, but had to go back. She had to face her difficulty, change her attitude to her, to her mistress and submit to her authority. Last Sunday in the UCB notes, there was this line, dismiss the notion that God does not see your struggle. As Hagar discovered, he is the God who sees, the God who hears, and the God who cares. He furthermore gave her a promise about the child she was carrying. So remember where you've come from and trust God to lead you to where he wants you to go. So the question is, are you heading in God's direction or your own? Another question is found in 1 Kings 19, and it's the story of Elijah. The story so far is that Elijah had challenged the prophets of Baal to a head-to-head -to, -head to see who is the true God. The one who answers by setting fire to bay wood on their respective altar is the true God, and they agreed to these terms. The prophets of Baal lost the contest, and the altar that Elijah had built and saturated with water was consumed by fire. The purpose of the showdown was for the people to know that the Lord is God, and he was bringing the people back to himself. They had wandered away and turned from him, but he was calling them back. God doesn't give up on us. Jezebel the queen was fuming when she heard that the prophets had all been killed, and she made a vow, took a, uh, took a vow, made an oath to kill Elijah the next day in the same way. And on hearing this, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. He goes south to Beersheba and then goes into the desert and sits under a tree. And there he prays in desperation. I've had enough. What's the point of going on? I give up. Please let me die. He is hungry, physically exhausted, emotionally drained, and feeling a failure. Definitely not a good place to be. And what does God do? He doesn't shout at him. He doesn't yell at him. He simply takes care of him. He meets his practical needs of sleep, food, and not just any food, freshly baked bread and water, not once, but twice. And this was enough to nourish him for 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah was running away from danger, but look where he's running to. He's running to Mount Horeb the mountain of God, where God had first made his covenant with his people. He traveled approximately 200 miles in just under six weeks. And in that journey, I wonder what he was thinking about in all that time. Had he thought where he'd come from and what God had done through him, all the miraculous signs that he had been involved in? He eventually arrives and spends the night in a cave. And this is where we pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. The word of the Lord came to him with a searching question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah simply offloads. He has a rant, a big moan. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I'm still on Jezebel's hit list. He is afraid. He is running away. He is discouraged, lonely, and simply pours out his heart and emotions to God. Some may criticize Elijah for running away, but I think in one way he's a great example of what we are to do when we are afraid, discouraged, exhausted, and tempted to run away. Because let's face it, we all have experienced these, these emotions 
And when we're in that state, generally we do get things out of perspective. So like him, let's turn to God. And again, God, um, in verse 11, God says to him, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. There was a mighty windstorm, there's an earthquake, there's fire, and then there's that gentle whisper. God meets with Elijah and shows that he is the God of the spectacular, yes, but he's also the God of the gentle whisper. We may want to see God of the spectacular, but we may hear him better and louder in the quiet whisper. Like Hagar, God has another assignment for Elijah. Elijah sorry. In verse 15, we read the following. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mehola to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. When God asks Elisha, what are you doing here? And, I, and Elijah just pours out his heart. God does not shout at him, and he doesn't say, there, 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 or you shouldn't be feeling like this, Elijah. Instead, he gives him a new assignment to anoint three people to continue the work in the next generation. And he left them with that great encouragement. Elijah, you are not alone. 7,000 others have not bowed down to bow. So we may think that we might be alone, but we're not. Through these examples of Adam being afraid, Hagar running away, Elijah both afraid running away plus a lot more, we see a God who searches, a God who sees, a God who hears, and a God who encourages. So don't be afraid. Let him ask you, where are you? Where have you come from? Where are you going? What are you doing here? As Psalm 32 tells us, and Chris read it earlier on today, God forgives us when we confess our sins. He is our hiding place, and he will instruct us and teach us the way we should go. He will counsel and watch over us. May the Lord bless you and keep you.